Hi, welcome back to CS560. So today we will talk about um, two applications of the DAPS first search, DFS algorithms. The first one is topological sorts, and the second one is strongly connected components. Or to use DFS to find, more correctly speaking, the second problem is to use DFS to find the strongly connected uh, components in a graph. The first application, topological sort, um, it applies to a directed acyclic graph, or it's called DAG. So uh, direct means it has all the edges have directions. And acyclic means that there's no cycles. So if you follow if you start from anyone from any vertex in the graph and you go through follow any edges to go through the graph you will never re go back to the vertex itself there will be no cycles and such kind of a graph is called a DAG directed acyclic graph so a topological sort must be applied to a DAG and it's basically a ordering because it's a it's a kind of a sort algorithm it is a ordering of all the vertices in the graph such that if an edge from u to v exists in the graph then in the results of the topological sort the vertex u must appear before the vertex v okay so if the edge that points from u to v in the original graph then within the results of topological sorts the the vertex u must before appear v okay so um it's uh, um um a ordering of all the vertices so that the precedence information among all the vertices are preserved okay so because a directed graph can be used can often used to indicate uh, dependencies or precedence relationship among vertices or among uh, events for example uh, if we um, use a graph to represent all the things we need to do when we get up in the morning then you can see that something is must happen before some other things uh, happen so we must put on our socks before we put on the shoes okay we also we must uh, put on the shirt first before we put on a tie and then our jackets okay so there the a, a directed graph can be used to describe such a uh, um, sequential events that the later on in which the later on later events depend on the previous events okay so an edge from u to v so if u is for socks and v is for shoes so this edge from u to v means that that event the u event must happen before the v events okay so an example of running topological sorts on these um, sample inputs is that all the events are reordered okay so we put it into an order and all the edges within this topological sort without pointed from left to the right okay so there is no edge from left from right to left so that left to right uh, direction means that all the events that happened before must appear to the left of the events that that happens later okay so socks is before shoes under shorts and pants are before shoes as well and shirts is before belts and tie is before jackets okay so 
it basically uh, preserves the results of the topological sort preserves the dependent the precedence information within the original graph. So how do we um, implement this topological sort or how do we um, implement this um, achieve this algorithm? So we can basically use uh, the DFS or more, more precisely speaking the advanced version of DFS that we implemented before and in that just as a reminder in that advanced version of uh, DFS we need to record the timestamps that we first visit one vertex and also the time that we finished visiting one vertex. So we have a D time and an F time indicate that the time we start and time we finish for each vertex. The implementation of topological sort is quite simple. So within this <coughs> topological sort procedure on graph G, we just need to use three lines of code. So the first line of code we call DFS on the graph to compute the finishing times for each vertex V in the graph. Okay, so this DFS procedure is the advanced or enhanced version of DFS that we defined previously. And in line two, when each vertex is finished, okay, so within the process of running the DFSG, <clears throat> when each vertex is finished, we just insert it, insert the vertex onto the front of a linked list. So those vertices who finish earlier will be insert, inserted first. Okay, they will be inserted to the front and the the vertex finished at a later time will be appended to the to the tail of the linked list and when all the vertices are finished and inserted we just return the linked list of vertices and that linked list is just the topological sort results that we need okay so the results of running a DFS on this uh, example here, we have shirt vertex has the uh, has the earliest visiting time, and the jacket has the first finish time. Okay, so jacket is finished first. So jacket is inserted into the front of the linked list. And the next one finished will be tie. So tie will be inserted at right after jacket. Okay? And um, next it comes the belt. It has finished time seven. And then it comes shirt. Okay. And the watch shoes. So uh, as you can see, the finish time within uh, within this results of linked list if you look at it from right to left the finish time is increasing okay the node the vertices on the right they are finished first and uh, those on the left side they are finished at a later step okay so but since um dfs the results of dfs is not really unique okay uh some of the vertices they are not reachable from the source vertex so uh, the results of the dfs may be different depending on which vertex you start depending on which is your source vertex okay so previously we have shirts as our source vertex because it has the uh, visit visit time as one it is the first vertex being visited okay but uh, um, if we choose a different vertex, the results of DFS will be different. 
it can be different, and so will be the results of topological sorts. Okay, so in this second example here, if we choose the undershots as the source vertex, so its visit time will be one, right? And if we run go through run the if we run the DFS using this order using this sequence, then pants will be the second and belt will be the third, and the jacket will be four, and jacket will be the first one being uh, finished. And the second one will be belt, and then shoes, okay? Okay, and shoes will be finished. So, as a result, we have a different set of finishing times when we choose undershorts as the source mode, okay? So if we follow these finishing times and we put the um, vertex finished earlier to the front of the linked list, jacket will be still be the first one, right? And then it comes belts and then comes shoes and then comes pants and then undershorts, okay? And socks and so on. So this reordering this ordering, this results of topological sort is different from the one that we have, we saw in the previous slide. Okay, and uh, but it still satisfy our requirements that all the edges in these results they pointed from left to right, and there is no edge from right to left. Okay, as long as that without. Uh, that requirement is met, then we say it's still a valid topological sort without. Okay. And uh, empirically, it just makes sense because, um, for example, for the watch uh, component, it is not connected to any other event. So you can move this watch vertex freely. You can put it right after socks. But after shoes, right? So it doesn't doesn't actually matter where you put it, okay? And for those socks events, it also has multiple places to put. You can put right on un after under shorts or after pants, as long as shorts is before shoes. So the whole requirement is met. So that's basically why we will have multiple results of topological sort. Okay. So let's uh, analyze the running time of topological sort a bit and it's also quite straightforward because we just call DFS once. And from the previous lecture we already know that DFS runs in big theta of V plus E time and V is the number of vertices and the E is the number of edges. Okay. And the cost for inserting each vertex into the front of a linked list is constant time. So altogether, the running time for topological sorts is also big theta of V plus E. Okay, so in practice, we just use uh, topological, topological sorts uh, a lot. And, but we don't uh, actually need to know why this, uh, the previously uh, introduced topological sort procedure, it is correct, okay? But uh, if you wanna know how we prove it, we need to uh, use uh, such a lemma to help us prove the procedure is correct. So this lemma says that um, if a directed graph is a cyclic, um, then the DFS on that graph will yield no back edges. Okay, so if, or in, in another way, if DFS yields a back edge, then the input direct graph is cyclic or contains a cycle in it. So it's quite uh, straightforward. Um, uh, without because as you see if the DFS generates some back edge that pointed 
from some descendants versus to some ancestor um, um, ancestor verdicts in the DFS tree, then this edge is classified as back. So following all the tree edges here and then the back edge back will go to will go from pants to belt to jack and then to pants. So this is definitely a cycle. So this lemma will be help will will help us to prove why topological sort is correct. Okay, so how do we prove that the topological uh, sort procedure uh, produce, produces a topological sort of the input deck? Okay, so why DFS uh, uh, use the DFS and follow the uh, order of the finishing time will give us the results we want. Okay, so as a proof, um, we just need to show that for any pair of distinct vertices u and v and if the graph contains an edge from u to v then the finish time of v should be smaller than the finish time of u Okay, as long as that relationship holds, then our procedure is correct, right? Because our procedure will pick the smaller, pick the vertices of smaller finish time and insert it to the front of the linked list first. Okay, so as long as we show that for any edge from U to V, the finishing time of V is always smaller than the U, then our procedure is correct. Okay. So first, when the edge from U to V is explored, then V cannot be gray. So it cannot be already visited because when V is already visited, then V could be an ancestor of U. So in that case, U and V, the, the edge from U to V would be a back edge. So according to the previous slide, our lemma says that if there's a back edge in the DFS, then the, the, the input graph is uh, not a cyclic. There is a cycle in it, then it is not a dead. So we, we just can't uh, run topological sort on, the, on, on that input graph. Okay, so when V is white, so because V cannot be gray, so when V is white, it, that means by the time V, uh, by the time U, the, the edge U to V is explored, V is not explored yet, so it becomes a descendant of U. Okay, so that means the finish time of V will be smaller than u okay so then ancestor will always be finished at a later time because it's depth first search okay all the uh vertices all the children vertices or all descendant vertices will be finished first before the before the uh ancestor finishes okay so that is what we want okay so if v is white then we would naturally have the smaller the finish time of V is smaller than U. Okay? And if V is black, okay, that means it's already finished. Okay. So but we are still exploring from U. So that means uh, we have yet to set the finish time of U. Okay. So once we do, we would of course have the finish time of V should be smaller than the finish time of U. Okay, so that is also a natural uh, relationship. Okay, so combining all the conditions, we would have that the finish time of V is smaller than the finish time of U for any edge within the graph. Okay, so that's how we prove that the topological sort procedure is correct. We'll 
generate the uh, topological sort without that we want. Now let's talk about the second application of DFS, strongly connected components. So this is a very classical application of DFS and the main um, goal of this type of this problem is to decompose a directed a directed graph into its strongly connected components. So many other algorithms rely on this decomposition and uh, after we decompose the graph into several components, several strongly connected components, and then we'll run such algorithms separately on each component and then we can kind of combine it without combine the solutions. So what is a strongly connected component SCC? So uh, we say that a directed graph, we say a whole graph is strongly connected if every two or any two vertices are reachable from each other. Okay, so if I take any two vertices from a graph and they are always reachable from each other, then we say the whole graph is strongly connected. And the strongly connected components as CC of a directed graph are the classes of vertices under the mutually relation. Okay, because it's not sometimes it's not necessarily the case that all vertices are uh, reachable from each other, but within a certain class or certain subsets of vertices of a graph, all the any two vertices within that subset are mutually reachable from each other, then we say that subset is a strongly connected component. Okay, so for example, if we take this simple graph as an example, then clearly this whole graph is not a strongly is not uh, strongly connected because if we start from one then obviously three and or six three and six they are not uh, reachable from vertex one okay but we can find the several strongly connected components for example for the components for the collection of vertices 1, 2, 4, 5. So within this subset, any two vertices within these subsets are mutually reachable from each other. For example, if you start from 1, 2 is reachable from 1. Okay? And if you start from 2, you can go from 2 to 4 and then 4 to 1 and that means 1 is also reachable from 2 even though there is no direct edge from 2 to 1 but 1 is still reachable from 2 and it's true that within this blue region the blue subsets any two vertices are mutually reachable from each other so then we say uh, 1, 2, 4, 5 is a strongly connected component Okay, so the tricky part is that the vertex, the vertices 3 and 6 together, they don't form a SCC. Because even though, although 3 is reachable from 6, you can go from 6 to 3, but you can never go from 3 to 6. So these two, they are not mutually reachable. So that's why we have to split 3 and 6. So for this example, we have three strongly connected components. And more formally speaking, a strongly connected components or SCC of a directed graph G is a maximal set of vertices. Okay, so this C is a subset of all vertices such that every pair of vertices within C, we can always have 
both the path from u to v and the path from v to u. Okay, that is to say they are mutually reachable. Okay, so here we had some new notations using these curly uh, arrows. So these curly arrows they doesn't mean they don't mean the direct edge from u to v, but they mean there is a path from u to v it could be an edge or could be several edge edges connected by other vertices okay so as long as they're always passed from u to v and v to u for every pair u and v within c then we say c is a maximum set of vertices or uh, uh, is a strongly connected components of the graph Okay, so the next question is how do we get the SCCs, right? How do we obtain or all, all the possible, all possible strongly connected components given a directed graph? Okay, so in order to do that, we need some um, uh, background knowledge about a transpose of a graph. Okay, given a directed graph g of v and e, then we define its transpose as a new graph which consists of all the original vertices but with all the edges reversed. Okay, so this transpose of the edge means that for each edge from v to u in the original edge set we reverse it by pointing from u to v. Okay, so this transpose of e is the reverse, is the transpose of the original edge set. In another language, uh, the transpose of capital E is the set of edges uh, with their directions reversed, okay? And the running time for create this transpose of a graph, G, with G transposed, is big O of V and E, V plus E, because we basically need to go through all vertices and then um, apply an, a reverse or transpose operation on each edge, okay? So, um, that is the preparation knowledge for uh, transpose of a graph. And next, let's look at the algorithm uh, for computing all the strongly connected components. So these strongly connected components um, procedure um, there are uh, four lines of code, but each in one line one and line three, it calls the predefined DFS procedure. Okay, so here the DFS is still the enhanced version of DFS, okay, which we used for topological sort as well. Okay, so the first line calls the DFS on the original graph G so that we can have the finishing times computed for each vertex within the graph okay recorded in the uh, f time attributes okay and afterwards in line two we compute the transpose of the original graph okay so now we have g uh, superscript t g transpose which is a new graph okay with all the same vertices but with all the edges reversed and at the third line we call the dfs procedure again but this time on the transpose of the graph okay but we need to pay attention that within this second call of dfs on g transpose within the main loop of dfs we need to consider all the vertices in the order of decreasing finishing time okay we need to iterate over all vertices in the decreasing order of the finishing time 
values and these you, this f time is computed from the first call of dfs okay so or let's say say it another language so if we we need to first call the dfs on the original graph and so that the f time are recorded for each vertex and then we use the then we compute the transpose of the graph but in that transpose of the graph all the f time all the attributes and the, the vertices are copied from the are copied from the old graph so that the f uh, transposes they are uh, kind of remembered okay so uh, at least the f the f information the f times they are they are preserved from the first run of dfs and this f time will be the clues of how we go through the vertices in the second run of dfs okay and then after the dfs is done we'll just output the vertices of each tree in the dfs forest and those trees each tree will be one um, strongly connected components okay so here i would like to elaborate a bit more on what we mean by consider the vertices in order of decreasing uh, finishing time u dot f so uh, here are the code for the dfs procedure that we uh, defined for the advanced version of dfs it's basically a dfs uh, procedure with a dfs visit procedure okay so for in the dfs procedure we have a for loop that go through all the vertices within the graph and we will call dfs visits on each vertex right so for this for loop we need to go through all the vertices in some order okay and the line three we say that we need to go through the vertices in such an order that their finishing times are decreasing okay and that finish time is a result of running the first dfs on the original graph okay so in this within the second run of dfs we need to use the information from the first dfs okay and within the dfs visits procedure there is also a for loop right to go through all the vertices all the adjacent vertices within some vertex u so this for loop also needs to follow the same decreasing finishing time order okay so by set setting up these limits setting up these constraints uh, by uh, about iterating over the vertices in decreasing finishing time order we make sure that the vertices finished um, at a later time at a later time step in the first dfs will be iterated over first in the second in the second dfs okay and then in the next example we'll see why these constraints matters and how they how the two run of dfs with the transpose of the graph will give us the strongly connected components now let's use this example to showcase how the strongly connected components procedure runs okay so given this input graph we have eight vertices from a to h and it's a directed graph okay and uh we will need to first call dfs on this original graph and calling a dfs will result in the starting time and the finishing time for all the vertices right so uh, simply assume that we start from the vertex c so c the visiting time for c the d time will be one and the finishing time for c according to the dfs procedure it'll be 10 okay and we have all the other all the finishing times available for all the other vertices once dfs is done okay and secondly we need to okay so also as a result the tree edges are shaded here so 
uh, the result of a DFS is a DFS forest that consists of multiple DFS trees, and uh, all the tree edges are shaded here. Okay, and the next step is to compute the transpose on the original graph. So I have shown the transpose of G here. So all the vertices, all the connections are the same, but the the directions of the edges they are reversed. So originally C is connected to D here, but here it is reversed. And originally C is directly connect to G. There's an edge from C to G, but now the edge is from G to C. So that reverse applies to all the edges. So here is just the, the transpose of the graph. And now the third step is to run DFS on the transpose of the graph. But note that we need to consider all the vertices in the order of decreasing finishing time. So this finishing time is the previously computed finishing time from the first run of DFS. Okay, see we need to based on these 14, 16, 10, 9, 15, 4, and so on to decide which vertices to visit first in the second run of DFS. Now let's go through the second run of DFS on the transpose of G step by step. Okay, so the first DFS have provided information about the finishing times for all the vertices here. And the second run of DFS need to go through the vertices in a decreasing order of the finishing time. So that means the vertex that has the highest finish time, the largest finish time, which is vertex B, will be the first vertex to go through in the second run of DFS. Okay, so the starting time or visiting time for vertex B will be 1. Okay, and then follow the rules of DFS. A will be the second vertex being visited, and E will be third, and then E will be finished, and then A will be finished, and B, and C, B will be finished at time step 6. Okay, so the next one will be visited is also chosen according to the finishing the old finishing time here so because C has the largest uh, um, finishing time among the rest of the among the remaining vertices so C will be the next one to be visited and D will be visited and finished okay and the next one after C and D are visited will be the G because it has the, the biggest uh, finishing time 7 and then F will be finished and then H will be visited and finished okay so now we have a new set of finishing times and starting times because we have a new run of DFS on the transpose of G okay so the results as a result of the DFS on the transpose of G it produces four depth first trees as a forest so I shaded all the tree edges here. So the first tree is from B to A to E. So that's a tree, okay? And the second tree is from G to F. And the third tree is D to C. And the, the last vertex H itself is a, is a tree, okay? So they, these four trees are exactly the four strongly connected components that we want to find okay so if we highlight them into different colors the first tree correspond to the set of vertices a and b and e and the second is c and d the third is f and g and the fourth is h so these four subsets are the four strongly connected components of both g transpose and g they are the four strongly connected components okay so we say the transpose of the graph and the original graph they share the same strongly connected components okay so on the left this is the original graph g right and on the right is the transpose of graph uh, gt so the strongly connected components that we computed are exactly the same 
strongly connected components in the original graph. Okay, so that's how we uh, use a simple example to show how the algorithm works to find the SCCs of a directed graph. So based on the results of running, of obtaining all the strongly connected components of a graph, we can create some new concept called component graph out of the original graph. So the component graph, we use the superscript SCC to indicate it because it depends on the results of a SCC analysis. Okay, so all the new vertices within this component graph are based on the strongly connected components, and so is the so are all the edges. Okay, so the the original graph is like this, right? Uh, assume that we have run the SCC, uh, we have found all the SCCs uh, from the original graph, and we can think of each strongly connected component we can think of each scc as one vertex okay so because scc is a collection or a subset of vertices so now we think of the capital c1 which is the collection of a and b e we can think of c1 imagine it as a new word as as a uh, as a new uh, vertex okay and we can also uh, merge all the edges from one component to another component into one edge. Okay, so the result is that we have a simplified um, version, a simplified view of the original graph, which is our component graph. And within this new component graph, each vertex is a um, kind of a uh, collection of original vertices and the edges are the merge of the original edges okay so this component graph is a kind of a summarized description or compact description of the original graph by viewing each strongly connected components as one point or one vertex okay so Next, we're gonna look at the correctness of the algorithm of the of the strongly connected components procedure. So, we we basically want to know why by running two DFSs and uh, with a transpose of the graph will give us the strongly connected components. So this is not uh, required by this course to understand uh, all the proves all the lemmas and the theorems but uh, it'll be a um, really interesting uh, process to go through the the proof and uh, but in practice all we need to know is that by running a dfs once and then transpose the graph and run on the second um, run the second dfs with some additional constraints then we are able to get the uh, strongly connected components Okay, so in order to analyze the correctness of the algorithm of the strongly connected component algorithm, we need to use some lemma. So we let um, C and C prime to be two distinct uh, strongly connected components. Okay, in the graph, and we let U and V to be the vertex within the subset c okay and let the u prime and the v prime within the subset c prime okay and also suppose that there is a path from u to u prime it doesn't necessarily to be a direct edge but it could be several segments of edges okay and this lemma says if there is a path from u to u prime then the whole graph shouldn't contain a prime a, a path from v prime to v okay so it this lemma basically states that the 
connection between two strongly connected components is should be one directional. Okay, if it's a two direct, if there is a if there is a two directional connection, then the two components they are not two distinct strongly components, strongly connected components. They actually can be merged into one strongly connected component. So that's what basically this lemma says. Okay. So the proof is also straightforward. So if we assume that there is a path from V prime to V, okay, then we can go in back from, we can go all the way from U prime to V prime and then to V and then to U, which means U and V, U and U prime are mutually reachable. Then it obviously contradicts the assumption that C and C prime are distinct SCCs. So that is one uh, lemma, one needed for the proof of the algorithm. Okay. So basically, it says when there there could be only there only could be two uh, one way connection between two SCCs. Okay. So now, at the second step of preparation, we need to um, extend the notions for discovery and uh, finishing time or uh, D time and F time in the DFS. Okay, so here all the this D time and F time here we refer to are those computing the, in the first call of DFS on the original graph G. Okay, so assume that a G graph is like this. Okay, and all the finishing times are in the node uh, in the vertices, and then we can define the starting and the finishing time of a set of vertices instead of a just one vertice. Okay. So what we do is that for any subsets of the vertices or the vertex of all the vertices, then we can define the discovery time of that subset U to be the smallest discovery time among all the vertices in that subset okay and the finishing time of the subset u to be the maximum finishing time of among all the vertices within that subset that totally makes sense right so we given a subset of vertices we choose the earliest we, we let the discovery time of the earliest, we, we use the earliest discovery time as the discovery time for the whole subsets. And then we use the latest finishing time as the finishing time for the whole subsets. Okay. So in this uh, SCC C1, the strongly connected components C1, C2, and uh, C3, three and C4 like this, we can define the discovery time for C1 to be 11, right? Because among C1, it's A and B and E, and B has the smallest discovery time 11. So for the whole component C1, we call the discovery time of C1 to be 11. And the finishing time of C1 is 16 because this is the latest finishing time for B, okay? And similarly, for C2, the starting time is 1 and the finishing time is 10. For C3, the starting time is 2 and the finishing time is 7. Okay, So here is just the, the second step of extending the notations of discovery and the finishing time. Okay, And then we'll use a second lemma, the lemma 2. Okay, So now let C and C prime to be two distinct strongly connected components in the graph. So suppose there's an edge from U to V exists in the original graph and the U is in one component in C and the V is in another component is C, C prime. Then we must have the finishing time of C should be greater than the finishing time of C prime. Okay? And this is the lemma too. So it basically says that if there is an edge from 
C1 to C2, right? Then the finishing time of C1 should be greater than C2. Okay, so that is true. And if you look at C2 and C3, there is an edge between C2 and C3, from C2 to C3, right? So the finishing time of C2 is greater than C3. And there is an edge from C3 to C4, so the finishing time of C3 is greater than C6, or uh, than the finishing time of C4. So that's the lemma too of the about the relationships of finishing times among all the strongly connected components. Now let's see how we prove the lemma two. Okay, so uh, we need to consider two cases when we prove the lemma two. So we need to the two cases depend on which SCC among C and C prime has the first discovered vertex during the first DFS. Okay, so we look at the two cases separately. So if uh, in case one if the discovery time of C is smaller than the discovery time of C prime, that means we discover the first, the, the first element, the first vertex being discovered is in C, not in C prime, okay? So we let X to be the first vertex discovered in C, okay? And uh, by the time stamp of the D time of X, all the vertices in C and C prime are not discovered, right? Because we assume that it is the first vertex being discovered, okay? And because the lemma says there is an edge from U to V, okay? So for any vertex in C prime, there is always a path from X to U and U to V and V to W, okay? That is true for any vertex in W, okay? So all the vertices in C and C prime, they become the descendants of the X of the very first uh, vertex being discovered in the depth's first tree, right? So X has the latest finishing time because X is, the, is the, on top of the, the DFS tree, right? And the root node of DFS tree always have the latest finishing time because it's Depth first search will finish the descendants uh, vertices first, and then we finish the root vertex uh, in the last time step. Then, that's therefore the finishing time of C is greater than the finishing time of C prime, right? So we have proved the first case, and in the second case, um, it says. The second case is that the first discovered element, the first discovered vertex was in C prime instead of C. Okay, so now let's assume that Y is the first vertex being discovered in C prime. Okay, and all the vertices in C prime they become the uh, descendants of Y. So the finishing time of the whole component C prime is just the finishing time of Y. Okay, because the finishing time of Y is the latest finishing time. And since there is an edge from C to C prime, so now we need to use the lemma one. The lemma one says that the two strongly connected components should be connected from one way. There shouldn't, there shouldn't be a two-way connection. So there shouldn't be any vertices, any edges from C prime to C. Okay, so C is not reachable from C prime. No vertex in C is reachable from Y. Okay, by the time, that means by the time Y is finished, none of the vertices in C are discovered. Okay, and that implies the finishing time of C should be smaller, should be bigger than the finishing time of C prime. Because by the time C is finished, uh, by the time C prime is finished, none of the vertices in C is, is uh, discovered yet, okay? So combining these two cases, the proof is done, okay? And uh, based on lemma two, we can have a, uh, 
corollary of lemma 2. So that's basically telling the same thing as lemma 2. Okay, so let C and C prime be two distinct strongly kinetic components in a graph and suppose that now suppose that there is an edge from U to V not in E but in the transpose of E. Okay, and in the transpose of E U is in C and V is in C prime then the finishing time of C should be smaller than the finishing time of C prime. So that is a opposite uh, statement compared to lemma 2, but it's the same thing, right? Because now this time we are thinking about the transpose of the graph, okay? So suppose there's, a trans there's an edge from U to V in the transpose of the graph, okay? Because U and V is in the transpose, so from V to U, the edge from V to U is in the original graph. Okay, then according to lemma 2, the finishing time of C prime should be greater than FC. Okay, so this uh, corollary of lemma 2 is basically the same thing as lemma 2. Now, based on the lemma 2 and the corollary, the corollary of lemma 2, we are able to, we can see why the SCC algorithm works. Okay, so uh, let's just return to the procedure. So when we perform the second DFS on the transpose of G, we start with the components whose, the finish, whose finishing time is the maximum, right? Because we use the decreasing order of finishing time um, to choose vertices. So essentially we're choosing the strongly connected component C whose finishing time is uh, maximum. And then, uh, we will we simply start with some vertex in that component and visit all the vertices in C. Okay, so that's what we, basically what we do with the, the uh, SCC uh, procedure. We choose some x within it and then we finish. We visit all the all the vertices within C. Okay, uh, but since the the corollary of lemma two says the the transpose of the graph should not contain any edge from C to any other SCCs. It is only acceptable, only the edges from other SCCs to the current C are acceptable because C has the highest the maximum, uh, has the maximum uh, finishing time. And if there is a edge from C connected to other SCCs, then that breaks the, that breaks the relationship of finishing times okay there could only be edges from other SECs to C but no edges out from the current C current uh, component C okay so the second DFS will not visit other vertices outside C okay so the second DFS will only visit all the vertices within C and the resulting DFS tree contains exactly the vertices of C. Okay, so that's why the the resulting tree from the second DFS can represent the strongly con strongly kinetic components of C. Okay. And assume that we have three strongly kinetic components, C, C prime and C double prime, and their finishing times are in such an order, okay? Okay, so note again that the finishing time here we refer to are the finishing times from the first DFS. Okay, so when all the vertices in C are visited, then the second DFS will select some vertex in C prime. Okay, because its finishing time is a second maximum. And similarly, there, other than C, except for C, there will be no uh, edges coming out. Okay. So all the the search will visit all the vertices in C prime because only edges coming out from C prime are in C, but C is now already visited. Okay, so the second DFS will without in a depth first will without in the DFS tree uh, that uh, whose vertices are exactly the strongly connected components C prime. So nothing in C double prime will be visited, okay? So 
you can uh, think of you can imagine uh, you can think of this analysis or extend this analysis to all the uh, strongly connected components in the graph okay so that's how the proof of uh, strongly connected components algorithms works okay so as I said this is not required uh, but uh, it will be useful for you to understand the nature of uh, what strongly connected components are in the graph, in the directed graph. Okay. All right. So that's so much for the strongly connected components problems. And uh, as a little bit wrap up, LCC is a very classical problem that is very common in real world scenarios. For example, in social networks, we can use SEC to define the communities of people whom are very, whom have stronger connections with each other. And we can use, uh, SEC is used in uh, search engine techniques that um, find related web pages and cluster them together, okay? And also, it can be used to identify the cyclic dependencies in the in the program. Okay, and um, uh, that's the all everything we have here today for the lecture. And uh, we have talked about the topological two basically two applications of DFS: the topological sorts and uh, the SEC problems. And from the next lecture on we will be discussing we will be talking about uh, the more advanced graph algorithms that deal with the graphs that have weights assigned to the edges and thank you